Paul is there at Caesarea Maritima, and um, he is going to stand trial before uh, Felix, Antonius uh, Felix, and we uh, mentioned a few things about him last week, and the two things to keep in mind uh, is uh, this guy's very well connected politically, uh, and he's a brutal guy. Uh, there is uh, uh, there's no uh, love lost between him and Ananias, the high priest. In fact, he killed the previous high priest, Jonathan. Uh, he is known for his brutality, his way of putting down uh, a riot is just basically to have everybody killed, uh, take all the leaders and have them crucified to be able to say, probably not a good idea for you guys to continue to do this. We're going to read um, a little verse at the end where he holds Paul uh, in prison for two years in order to kind of gain favor with the Jews. And we know historically why he did that. Uh, there was so much of his heavy handedness uh, going on uh, in terms of the brutality that uh, Jewish leaders were writing letters and sending envoys to, uh, to Caesar uh, Claudius to try to do something about it. And so he, in the end, gets relieved of this position of uh, governor of Judea uh, as a result of some of that. Uh, and so, again, there'll be a mention of, even though he doesn't really like these guys, he's going to leave Paul in prison for, uh, for a couple of years. Got a little, here's a little picture of him, of uh, Mr. Felix, Antonius Felix. Maybe we'll just call him Tony for short, but uh, uh, a brutal guy. Now, again, he, uh, he comes to power uh, very, in a very unusual way because he's born a slave. But Claudius, who's not the emperor yet, but is basically his age, Claudius' mother is the one that sets him free, him and his brother named Paulus. Uh, they end up being raised with him, uh, and, uh, and it's through his brother's relationship with Claudius, the Caesar, who uh, his brother is the Caesar's treasure, so he's able to get him appointed to this position. 48 AD becomes governor of Samaria, 52 AD becomes governor of Judea, and he's relieved of that command in 60 AD. Paul's there for two years, we'll see him relieved of command, therefore we can pinpoint historically this is all taking place uh, around 58 uh, AD. Uh, again, very well connected uh, and a very uh, brutal guy. Now, he's been taken to uh, Caesarea Maritima, and uh, uh, i just say I'm sorry about that. that. It's one of those things where that looked really good when it was this big, you know, <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure what happened on the PowerPoint as he even got there. But anyway, it's just uh, an artist uh, perspective of what uh, Caesarea would have looked like back, back in the day, and um, the breakwaters and so forth. You can see things are built out on the water. So that doesn't hurt your eyes any longer. Let's go on to the next, next slide. So this is it uh, today. So um, there's a lot of areas. This area right here uh, that looked like that seating, it went all the way down. Uh, basically, this is where chariot races. It's called a hippodrome. No hippos. Hippodrome. They, ride, they would race in that area. And uh, we, uh, Paul's on trial. His pat, uh, the where the uh, palace was is built out over the water right in this area. I'll show you another shot in a minute. And further this way is, uh, going to the next slide, is this uh, amphitheater. This is all just north of Tel Aviv. Uh, if you do a, uh, a tour of Israel, this is your first stop on the tour, the very first day. Do a little teaching. Again, the Roman procurator at the time of uh, Jesus be being crucified uh, was, uh, was always in dispute. It's like, yeah, you mentioned him in the Bible, we never find his name anywhere, and it was finally uh, uncovered here uh, in this amphitheater when it was being uh, excavated. You can go on to the, uh, the next slide, and uh, uh, again, it just shows uh, this whole area was all built out. So the, uh, the palace and the area where Paul's being uh, on trial is all in this area. I just Beautiful uh, there on the edge of the Mediterranean. Then one more, one more slide. So this this whole area is part of the courtyard. When we talk about uh, Paul coming in for the trial, this is it. Uh, this is where it, it took place. Uh, obviously, we're in, we're over in one corner area of it, right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. That's uh, David Asarel, our guide. There's Greg right there. But uh, here are the other folks from our, our tour. So uh, beautiful area there in Israel on the. Uh, Sea of Galilee, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, and maybe that first drive, it wasn't so out of focus to give you a sense of the, the grandeur of this, uh, 
uh, entire complex that's been built there on the edge of, uh, of the Mediterranean. That's where Paul's been taken. That's the place of this particular trial. Uh, and basically, we're going to have the, uh, the Jewish council come present their case. Uh, we're going to have Paul point out uh, their lack of evidence uh, in the application of all this can be informational at the beginning. Uh, the last point is going to be the procrastination uh, of Felix himself as Paul preaches a very powerful message uh, to him. Well, let's look at the first nine verses. The Jewish council arrives to present their case. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator, it means a lawyer, named uh, Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul, and when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, uh, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lysias, came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented. They are going, yeah, yeah, maintaining that... Uh, these things were so. So they present their case through uh, Tertulla. So Roman law was as complex as our, uh, our law, legal system is today. Not too many of us would go to court without an attorney, uh, and neither do, uh, do they. Uh, he does what they normally did, which was this, this whole thing of uh, flattery. Keep in mind, these guys hate each other's guts. <laughs> you know, so Tertulla, he's Jewish, right? But he's a Hellenistic Jew, speak Greek, knows the Roman law. And he begins... Uh, Seeing that through you, we enjoy great peace. Yeah, great peace. That's why they needed 500 guys just to get Paul out of Jerusalem because we're enjoying such a great time of peace uh, and prosperity uh, and so forth. Oh, it's your great foresight. We are so thankful for you. <laughs> what a liar. But uh, uh, anyway, this is the, the, the flattery that was the, uh, the typical thing that was done to be expected. He gets through that and he presents two key accusations against Paul. One is personal, one's political. The personal, verse 5, we found this man to be a plague. That's not a compliment. Uh, NIV says troublemaker. Uh, King James says we found him to be a pestilence. But uh, So it's a, a personal attack against Paul. Of course, the Jews trying to maintain their traditions and so forth. Paul is bringing something new in terms of the gospel. And as uh, Vance Havner said, wherever Paul went, there was either a riot or a revival. And of course, in the case of Ephesus, there was both. So the, uh, uh, they have their conflicts. They bring this uh, personal charge against them. Uh, they've uh, already pointed out, again, that uh, Paul is uh, not under Roman authority, actually. Uh, but even so, as he travels in the, in the world of the Roman Empire, he causes trouble city to city. And then a political charge, sedition, uh, leading an illegal religion. Uh, Judaism was legal un under Rome. And uh, again, Luke is part of, part of the point of his writing, certainly is to capture the, the history of the early church and the spread of the gospel and so forth. The part of it uh, in his day was to make a case for the fact that Christianity was, in fact, a sect of Judaism. Therefore, it was legal. Therefore, they should not be persecuted. All of the early persecution that we read about in the book of Acts all came from Judaism. It all came from, uh, the, from the Sanhedrin, from leaders of synagogues where Paul preached the gospel in the Roman Empire. Uh, and Luke is making a case that, that uh, we should not be persecuted by the Romans themselves. Now that did happen, of course, because of the spread of Christianity, because it became less and less Jewish uh, all the time. Uh, notice, they, uh, again, the political charges are, are very, uh, very severe. Would have gotten Felix's attention. Verse 5, we found this man... Uh, a play, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect uh, of the Nazarene. Creator of dissension. Uh, uh, Weiss translates this uh, this way, an instigator of insurrections among the Jews throughout the Roman Empire. So 
He is leading re rebellion against Roman authority. That's what they're saying against him. Now, that was not true, of course. Paul was not doing that um, in any way. He's, in fact, telling everybody to be good citizens. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, he says, to the church in Rome and so forth. Uh, but um, the, uh, uh, this lawyer is uh, stretching the truth here <laughs> quite, quite a bit. Now, there was a little basis uh, for what he was saying because he, Paul did preach that Jesus Christ was both Lord and King, and he was preaching uh, his kingdom. These are the same charges brought against Jesus, by the way, that he was preaching uh, a kingdom uh, in, uh, uh, in, again, contrast to uh, Roman uh, in their empire. So there is an element of truth to it, but again, this attorney uh, bends the truth to, uh, to uh, fit his uh, means. Now, he does mention the fact that uh, uh, it's a sect of Judaism at the end of verse 5, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. First time mentioned in Scripture, the Nazarenes. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a denomination today, but in the first century, uh, again, it was one of those terms that was used with Christians. They were referred to as the way. Uh, they were referred to as uh, Nazarene because of where Jesus was from. And, uh, and he's trying to say that that uh, we consider them a sect, but we consider them illegal. Judaism is legal, and so you have different sects, Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and so forth. Uh, and there is the sect of the Nazarenes, or the way. But we're say they are saying, but we reject them. We don't see them as being part of Judaism, uh, and they're trying to basically out them so that uh, Christianity would be considered illegal uh, by the Romans. So two charges he makes against Paul. Uh, one is personal, he's a pest. Uh, two, uh, he leads dissension against the Roman government wherever he goes uh, throughout the, the world. And of course, then he, uh, he alludes to uh, the reason that they had basically taken Paul uh, into custody because he was trying to profane the temple. Is that what happened? <laughs> no, he was in there worshiping, right? And then, and then the guys from Ephesus said, that's Paul. He brought a Gentile in. Let's get him. You know, they're, they're going to tear him apart, you know, if uh, uh, the commander, uh, Lysias, doesn't uh, intervene. Uh, he makes reference to him. This accusation he's got to be very careful uh, about. When he prints the, presents the idea that Lysias actually created the problem by removing Paul from their custody. That's in verse 6. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lysias, came by with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers uh, to come to you. So basically, he said, uh, to, to Turlius is saying that, uh, that uh, we could have handled this, and uh, we know that you would have preferred us to do this, which the Romans would. Hey, you got uh, Jewish traditions, Jewish uh, issues, uh, things according to your law. Deal with it. Don't bother uh, us with it. And they allowed them, even, even up to execution, we've got uh, historical records of that. What Paul was accused of, of course he didn't do, but what he was accused of was punishable by death. And in fact, they carried out similar death penalties uh, to other Jews in, in the first century. Now he kind of lightens it and doesn't say, uh, what he did. He said he was trying to do this, but we were able to stop to him. You know, we're just having our own little trial here. But then that commander down there, he just jumps in. And by violence, he takes Paul's out of our hands. And by the way, where is he anywhere? He's not even here today. So the attorney's kind of going for it here a little bit. He's got to be very careful about the accusation against a Roman commander. But that's exactly what, uh, what he's saying here. He kind of does this, again, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the original accusation against Paul bringing a Gentile into the temple could never be substantiated. And two, the people that made that accusation, we identified them as men from Ephesus, are not there. Now, they're not there. So he's kind of got to lighten the charges uh, and basically say this was an internal issue. Just give us Paul back and, uh, and we'll deal with this whole thing. And in this closing argument... He's kind of edgy, getting a little edgy here when he brings the issue of Claudius uh, Lysias uh, into the whole story. So he presents his case. And then secondly, it's Paul's turn. Paul points out uh, the lack of evidence against him. That's in verse 10 to 21. 
Then Paul, after the governor had nodded uh, to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because you may answer, ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believe in all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Now, after many years, I came to, came to bring alms and offering to my nation, uh, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor in tumult. They, sought to have, uh, they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they find any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, Concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. So Paul points to their lack of uh, uh, evidence. Uh, he doesn't do the whole flowery thing, you know, to Felix uh, you know, or anything. He just says, hey, you've been judging this nation a long time. Uh, you know what's going on. And, uh, and you're familiar. You know, he's going to make reference to that uh, with, uh, with Christianity uh, in my own beliefs. But he points out, again, the lack of evidence very specifically in regards to the, uh, the charges of uh, uh, what he did in the temple. And uh, uh, Paul, we know, never preached uh, in Jerusalem, uh, be, except for that one little message he was trying to give uh, when they, when they uh, tore him apart. Pretty much had agreed to do that years before uh, with Peter. Uh, they, Peter had determined he was the apostle to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to uh, the Gentiles. He makes reference in, to that writing the letter to the church in Galatians chapter 2 verse 8 where he says for uh, he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised the Jews also worked effectively in me towards uh, the Gentiles so he's saying I was not there causing problems I was not there causing to dispute uh, or any kind of a, a riot uh, notice verse 11 because you may ascertain there's no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship from then 12 days he goes <laughs> By the way, I, I could have really pulled this thing off here. You think I could have organized uh, a, uh, an entire uh, uh, riot and rebellion against the, the Roman authorities in Jerusalem and, and done that in like four days? I'm not that good. Uh, I couldn't have pulled it off in that time. In a timeline, back in chapter uh, 21, Paul arrives in Jerusalem. The next day he met with James and the elders. The next day he went into the temple with the Nazarites, uh, day four in the temple, day five in the temple, that was about it. Day six, he's arrested in the temple, meets with the Jewish council. Day eight, threatened to take him to uh, uh, Caesarea. Day nine, arrives there. Day 10, waits for Felix. 11, waits for the Jewish leaders. Day 12, uh, they arrive, uh, the hearing is conducted. Paul says, you know, it was only 12 days. There's no way I could have uh, uh, pulled this whole thing off. Uh, and then, uh, points out the fact that, by the way, I was there going through purification rites. That means he registered with a priest. He paid for it. He's with four other guys that can all verify his story. And he says, I'm there worshiping God. I'm not there profaning the temple. If I've done anything wrong, you better see that priest because I obeyed him. So, you know, uh, so he, he's got uh, a lot of evidence to substantiate the fact that he wasn't doing what they were claiming. And then secondly, he deals with the issue, the bigger issue, uh, probably in terms of Felix, of sedition and heresy. Again, uh, Felix probably could care less about the heresy issue, uh, but he does uh, make reference to that. He goes, if I'm guilty of anything, it's that I believe in the resurrection. Now, when he said that, remember, in the Sanhedrin in the council, <laughs> it caused a little stir. Pharisees believe in the resurrection, Sadducees don't. And basically, they end up uh, in a big uh, fight uh, yelling, screaming at the top of their lungs, Paul screaming at the top of his voice to try to get their attention. They grab him. They're physically almost pulling him apart uh, when uh, 
the commander Lysias has to grab him and pull him out of the. He goes, what that was all about was the, uh, was just the idea of the resurrection. I have to kind of wonder at this point uh, in this setting, in that little courtroom that they're all kind of jammed into, again, because we've been there, it's, it's not that big. Uh, what, what did the Pharisees and Sadducees do at this point? Did they kind of start kind of stink eye each other, or whatever? Yeah, resurrection, see us, you know, there's a, you know, did they line up outside <clears throat> and, um, and do junk in a pot to determine whether they were going to scream and yell at each other inside the, uh, the courtroom or not? Uh, did somebody take them aside and go, listen, I need you to be on your best behavior, it's like you do with your kids. Uh, here's what you need to do. When, I don't know, but either way, they, they've determined to not get into it with each other in front of Felix. But Paul brings the issue up again. He goes, that's the only thing I'm really guilty of uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, my faith uh, and what I'm teaching and what I, uh, I believe in. And he's not guilty of sedition. That's the heresy charges. It's simply a personal faith uh, in the resurrection. Paul points out that his purpose in being in the temple, as I've said, was he was there to worship the Lord. There was the temple priest that was in charge of his activities. Everything was being done decently and in order according to the law. Then he points to the lack of evidence in terms of the original accusers. Basically, if you're a Roman citizen and you were accused of a crime by a person, that person had to show up that day in court uh, and basically make his accusation face to face. It wasn't for everybody, but again, Paul was a Roman citizen. And he says, oh, by the way, uh, where are those guys? They're not here. Now, the Sanhedrin had to probably make a kind of a strategic decision uh, not to bring those guys. One, they wouldn't do well under cross-examination. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and two, uh, it could never be substantiated that Paul had done, not done any of these things and so they, they determined to leave these guys uh, out of the court proceedings. And then lastly, again, this idea Paul points to his faith in the resurrection. We could paraphrase that section uh, where Paul says, if I've done anything evil, it is probably this. I reminded the Jewish council of our great Jewish doctrine of the resurrection. And again, at this point, both sides would have had to restrain themselves to not get into a shouting match. Uh, right there. So that's both sides of the trial. Now we're going to have the response of, uh, of Felix himself. And uh, uh, very, again, very, very interesting what happens here in terms of his response to that day, uh, as well as uh, Paul's opportunity to preach to him uh, on a subsequent uh, day. Verse 22, but when Felix heard these things, uh, having more accurate knowledge of the way, means he knows a lot about Christianity, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide or visit him. After some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about the resurrection, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix. Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul Bound. So the procrastination uh, of Felix doesn't uh, make any decision, uh, even though apparently he's a pretty knowledgeable guy. The reference to verse 22, having a more accurate knowledge of the way. Uh, the NIV says, well acquainted with the, with the way. Now, he could have been because of his wife, Drusilla, who's Jewish. Or it could have been because he's the commander of Judea. Uh, there were uh, fights and riots and disputes between believing Jews and non-believing Jews. Uh, there was uh, issues that deal with uh, the run-of-the-mill Roman pagans and their, their run-ins with, uh, with, uh, with the Jews. So he had to study up, learn a bit about Judaism, and apparently he understands perfectly well, or per to a pretty good degree, uh, about uh, Christianity, who Jesus is, uh, and what it's all about. And it's made reference here to us by uh, Dr. Luke. Now, in terms of 
Paul, I mentioned that uh, he was in the uh, Caesarea Hilton. Uh, that's referred to there in verse 23. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. That means he was not kept in a common jail. Uh, he's actually being kept somewhere in the palace right there on the Mediterranean. Pretty nice digs. He's got uh, limited freedom, but he's got some freedom. Uh, he may have been chained to a soldier uh, for a six-hour shift uh, on occasion, which I think uh, there was probably a few soldiers that heard the gospel during that time period. I think Paul probably enjoyed the idea of somebody being <laughs> chained, chained to him for six hours. By the way, the soldier couldn't say a word. I mean, he, under order, he could, all he could do was guard the prisoner. Couldn't say a word. It just couldn't even tell Paul to shut up. I mean, he just so for six hours at a... Uh, at a time. I think he was having a pretty good time. Uh, uh, in the Greek, when it talks about his friends, it means they waited on him as personal servants so people could come and go. This goes on for, for two years. That's kind of the setting. Uh, but notice then, uh, very interesting, uh, we say secondly, Felix procrastinates making a decision even after he hears a powerful sermon from Paul. Great three-point message uh, uh, described in verse 24 and 25. He said, for Paul, heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about, this is his three-point sermon, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. When it says that Felix uh, was afraid, means he was terrified. Uh, he was shaken. He was shaken by what he's hearing. Romans don't do that. Roman rulers don't do that. They're poker-faced. They're stoic. They're trained to do this. They just listen and listen. They never... They never want to convey anything emotionally to anybody one way or the other. That's not happening. Uh, something uh, very uh, interesting is taking place uh, in this man's life. Now, I mentioned Drusilla and her connection with Christianity. She's been connected with Christianity through her family for a number of years. It was her great-grandfather that tried to kill Jesus as a babe in Bethlehem. It was her great-uncle that killed John the Baptist and personally mocked Jesus. It was her father that killed the apostle James. So she's well acquainted with Christianity through her family ties. Uh, Dr. Luke again gives us the three-point uh, sermon. But again, before we look at it a little more, keep in mind what Paul is doing. Paul is preaching this message to a man that if he doesn't like you, he kills you. Took a lot of guts. Just Let's just say that. Uh, you know, the application here for us is, is two, twofold. How do you preach the gospel? Well, sometimes you've got to do it with a lot of courage. You've got to be very specific. You've got to tell people the whole truth. That's what Paul does here, even if it's going to cost him his life. Secondly, it's how not to respond to the gospel. How not to uh, is seen in the life of, uh, of Felix. One of my, uh, one of my uh, teachers in graduate school, Dr. Cook, he, he started uh, International Baptist in the college that was there, graduate school for a number of years. And he came back uh, through Hawaii for the mainland did a did a, a, a week a week uh, long class with Lily's all day every day and it was an awesome time he's just an amazing man so he kind of lecture in the morning and then in the after lunch uh, we'd, we'd go for like eight hours he'd just basically say uh, tell me what you learned and then we'd just sit around and talk about that what we learned that morning and he'd say, he'd say tell me what you want to know and you could ask him anything and uh uh, there's like five guys in this class. It was a great time. He was an amazing, amazing person. I read a book about his life. He uh, raised on the mission field in India, uh, spoke, I think, three languages before he learned English. He actually had his own pet tiger <coughs> growing up, had a little trap door and, uh, made out of bamboo that he could lift up and talk to his tiger that was right below his, uh, his bedroom and so forth. Got so big, they uh, finally had to... Uh, <laughs> take it take it to the zoo because he had hand fed the thing uh, raising it so uh, when he was in high school uh, visited the zoo recognized his sagger and uh, climbed right over and went to see him kind of freaked out the teacher just a little and the tiger ran up to him and basically hugged him and they talked for a while and wrestled around on the ground a little and climbed back over the fence again Dr. Cook is an amazing guy started play, did a lot of planning uh, planning churches uh, in uh, Sri Lanka um, they would never, once he got his education, they would never let him back in India again. I guess his, his father was a little too effective in his ministry there. Uh, but he went to the Philippines eventually. He was down there just uh, really gifted language-wise. In the end, the guy could speak uh, uh, six or seven languages. Here in Hawaii for a while, pretty good pigeon, some Hawaiian, and, uh, uh, but uh, could preach in Tagalog after only uh, eight or nine months. 
uh, planted several churches, a couple of Bible colleges, some training centers, just a phenomenally gifted guy. Uh, it's during the early 60s uh, that he's down there when uh, communism uh, was attempting to take over the Philippines. And there was basically a, a mini a civil war uh, that was taking place. He was out late uh, one night past a, a curfew uh, and basically is captured by uh, a bunch of communist guerrillas. Uh, they uh, uh, questioned him and basically uh, beat him uh, quite a bit, uh, took his vehicle, shoved it over a cliff, had him get on his knees, and they're going to put a, uh, put a round in the, uh, in the back of his head. Uh, and he basically said, uh, um, and he's kind of like, well, whatever, Lord, you know, into my hands I commit my spirit kind of a thing. Uh, and he says, can I, can I just say one thing? Can I, can I just have a minute to say one thing? And, of course, he's speaking uh, in Tagalog to them. And they said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And so he just figures, well, this is the Apostle Paul before Felix. He'll just give it a shot. <laughs> and he just, he, he, they're behind him, and he's just facing over the cliff. He preaches the gospel to them uh, as long, as hard, as fast as he, as he could, uh, you know, always thinking that <laughs> this could all end very abruptly with a shot. He gets through his whole message, and then it's just dead silent. And he's kind of waiting and waiting, and finally he just can't take it anymore. And so he, he turns around. Every man was on their knees, and every man with tears in their eyes were crying, uh, waiting to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Praise with every one of them, including one of their top commanders. <laughs> now we had to go, okay, how do I get these guys out of here? Because if I get caught in a jeep with them, uh, the military guys are going to kill all of us, you know? So I hope we can get back to my house uh, undetected, of which, of, of course, they did. People do this. This is the setting for the Apostle Paul as he gives this message here. And notice point number one. Uh, it's, uh, it's righteousness. A holy God demands righteousness. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is the same holy God provides his own righteousness uh, through Jesus Christ. Daniel Webster once said, The greatest thought that anyone can think is that there is personal accountability to God. And certainly that was at the center of Paul's message. To these, these, <laughs> these two, this uh, couple that's uh, before him. He might have said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Everybody knows that there's a God of heaven. Everybody knows that one day they'll be, be held personal accountable for their lives. He may have mentioned that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he goes right to this issue of God's righteousness, his holiness, uh, what's gone wrong and our person accountable. Every person one day will stand before Jesus Christ. To some of us, he will wrap his arms around us and welcome us into his kingdom as his children and say, well done, my good and faithful servants. To others, he'll be a holy and a righteous judge sitting on a throne, but everybody will stand before uh, Jesus Christ one day. Back in 1973, a noted psychiatrist, Dr. Carl Minniger, wrote a book that was considered startling at the time called Whatever Became of Sin. He talked about the fact that the word sin had gra gradually been dropped from the vocabulary uh, in the United States and in the Western world. Instead, we use terms like mistakes, weaknesses, inherited tendencies, faults, and even errors. But nobody would face up to the fact of Sin. That was in 1973. Now we've got it in the church. There's a lot of churches that won't use that word. Never use that word from, from the pulpit. That's the word the Bible describes what separated us from a, a holy and a righteous God. Paul standing before a guy that could kill him at any moment, who, who wasn't very saintly. This guy is like the head of the syndicate in the Roman world, in a sense. And he's telling him, you will stand accountable before God one day. We stand before a righteous and a holy God. Uh, that's point number one. Just kind of illustrate it this way. Just to your knowledge of fine arts here. So this says, uh, this is the thinker. And just show you how much we've drifted as a culture. Since so is Rodin, he's a French Impressionist. And uh, of course, everybody looks at the statue and uh, wonders, what is the thinker thinking about? Well, I know what he's thinking about. He's thinking, where did I leave my clothes? <laughs> right? I mean, come on, the poor guy. That's got to be it, right? No, actually, uh, uh, the thinker, when uh, Rodin created it, uh, it was actually positioned uh, in another very important sculptural piece that he had done. 
uh, that was then lifted out and replicated in a larger form and uh, seen in museums around the world. Uh, this is actually uh, where it was first seen uh, in a sculptural piece that he did uh, entitled, you can go on to the next slide, entitled The Gates of Hell. See, there's the thinker right there. See all these people? They're being all cast into hell. That's, that's the idea. The thinker is looking down on them, and he's thinking about what would it be like to be separated from an eternal God for all eternity and to be cast into hell. That's what the thinker is thinking about. I can just tell you, you can go to a lot of museums and see the thinker, and none of them will make reference to what the thinker is really thinking about because we don't want to deal with this issue. But Paul does to this man Felix and to his wife Drusilla. His second point in the message was self-control. <laughs> this, is, this is something that neither one of these people uh, knew, <laughs> knew anything about, of course. Uh, but self-control uh, is very important. Uh, it is something that comes to us as a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Uh, it's, it's not something that uh, uh, we can talk, we can control a lot of things, except, but we don't control ourselves very well, apart from Christ. But in Christ, it becomes part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's something these people knew nothing about, and I'm sure in this context, as he discusses it, uh, the issue of the need of God's Spirit in us, controlling us, had to be part of this second point. His third point was the clincher, the judgment to come. Uh, and I, I don't know if, you know, we do have Paul's message to another uh, group of Gentile people there in Acts 17, uh, where he says, uh, uh, in the past, God has overlooked such ignorance, but now he has commanded all people everywhere to repent, for he, will, he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Uh, there is going to be a time where you will face the judgment. That's what he's telling uh, this couple here. Jesus Christ will either be your savior or he will be your judge. Uh, it's one of the two. How did Felix respond to all this? He trembled. He was scared to death. He was visibly shaken. The apostle Paul certainly uh, had to be able to see it and see the fear uh, in this man's eyes. That was... God's Holy Spirit convicting this man of his own sin. He is being weighed in the balance at this moment, whether he would repent and receive Christ or reject him. And of course, we know that he rejected him. And that's a very scary thing, uh, that, uh, that someone could hear it and hear it so clearly. To have it impact a man who is, prides himself in being stoic and never showing any emotion. He's losing it, and yet he still doesn't come to faith in Christ. Why? Because he just procrastinates. He doesn't say no. He just says, go away now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. And he did, but he never heard it the same again. That, that's a frightening thought, uh, that you can be convicted by God over something and just put it aside and put it aside and it's never the same again. The conviction is never the same again. Now, certainly the big concern is the unbeliever. They can hear the gospel and uh, be convicted of their own sin like this man was, not respond to it, and never have that same conviction again. Maybe hear the gospel again, but never quite. There's nothing to say they'll ever have that opportunity again. That's why Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 6, 6, 2. Uh, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day uh, of salvation. Edward Young wrote that procrastination is the thief of time. Uh, and we live in a culture that's known for its I'll <laughs> whatever, that I'll, that I'll take care of it tomorrow or later or manana, but it's, uh, uh, it never comes. Uh, there's the assumption. There's the assumption that there'll be another time, there'll be another opportunity and that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Again, we could listen to this and go, well, praise God. I received the Lord. Praise God. I, uh, I was touched by God's spirit. I did give my life to him and, uh, and everything. But God still speaks to our hearts, doesn't he? It may not be in regards to salvation, but it may, may be a, a calling on, on your life. Of the people that are called to go to the mission field. Of the, of the people that respond and go, yes, God's called me to uh, be a missionary. Only 15% ever make it. 85% never even make it to the mission field. 
People hear, people are convicted, God instructs, God leads. Uh, there's a sense of what God wants me to do, but I need to think about it more. I'll put it off for more. Uh, it's not just the big things. It may be just to take, take cookies across the street to the neighbor to try to show them the love of Christ. It could be the small things. It can really lay the procrastination thing on here. But I'm talking about hearing God's voice and in, in, in responding or not responding. Uh, it can be a, a dangerous thing. Just to date myself a little bit, back in the day, one of the biggest rock songs of, of all time uh, was a song called Stairway to Heaven. It actually had an element of truth. There is a stairway to heaven. Again, it's described to us in Genesis uh, through Jacob's dream. Lays his head on that pillow. There's a stairway in his dream to heaven. The angels are ascending uh, and descending. Uh, and of course, we come to realize later, the only way to walk that stairway to heaven is through our relationship with Jesus Christ. The song actually had an element of truth to it, but it also had a lie mixed in. One of the lyrics says, yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on and it makes me wonder, you don't have to decide now. You might recognize that Jesus Christ is calling you. You might recognize that you need to have your sins forgiven. There's always time later, that song says. And that's what Felix does here. That's the concern. Two big lessons here for all of us. And one is that when God's word comes to us and convicts us, uh, we should never put off a response for one of two reasons. One. Though we might hear the same truth again, it may not bring the same conviction again. And that's kind of a scary, uh, scary thought. You know, it's just like when you're, you're driving in your car and that warning light comes on. Well, you know, you could actually uh, push a thing in your dash to reset the light to make it go off. <laughs> but it won't, it won't help you because you're still going to have problems because you're, you don't have enough oil. You know, when the warning light comes on, you could take a little hammer and, and knock it out. Or you could actually do what uh, the engine is asking you to do. Uh, again, it was pathetically true of uh, Felix, uh, who sent Paul away, summoning him for another time. Apparently, he called again. He talked with him. Uh, but now his only motivation is greed. He's hoping he'll bring him a bribe, give him some money so that he can uh, set him free. Uh, but the experience he had right then, he never had again, apparently. And that's, that's a scary thing. Two, a truth not acted upon can harden us so that we cannot understand them. In other words, we understand it, but then uh, we lose that ability o over a period of time. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 13, where he says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says... Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. That's what the Lord wants to do. But there's a, there's a rejection and a rejection and a callousness and then and then it's diminishing. It's not quite the same. The previous verse in verse 12, uh, Jesus said, put it this way, for whoever has to him, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have even what he has uh, will be taken away from him. In other words, as we respond to God's voice and are be obedient to it, he speaks to us more. Uh, it becomes more, more clear. You know, the kids, uh, the youth group is doing a study right now in Strasbourg, Knowing God's Will. And when we first began it, I talked to them about the fact that, you know, if, if you'll listen and do God's will, it will become easier and easier for you to discern what God's will is. It will become easier and easier for you to do God's will. It'll become a pattern of your life. It's what you do. Of course, you're going to please the Lord. I've already reaped the benefits of following him for a period of time. But if you don't do it, it becomes harder. And it becomes harder. And it becomes more difficult. It, do, it doesn't get easier by disobeying God. It becomes easier because what you have, Jesus says, I will add even to that. You have some understanding of the word. Hey, study the word. You'll have even more understanding. If you don't, even what you have will be taken away. You know, there's a, enough of us here that probably know more than a few people that at one time walked very strongly in their faith in Jesus Christ, and they are no more. 
I mean, they're around. We might see them, but they, they're just not walking with the Lord anymore. You talk to them, and they don't read the Bible anymore. They're not. What what happens to these people? Uh, there there are people that hear God's voice and say no. Maybe another time. It's procrastination of what God wants of their lives, and even what they have is taken away. Says Jesus in Matthew 13. It's a frightening thing. Uh, it's a scary thing. Now, there's an opposite response. Another example, <clears throat> that would be the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas, uh, Acts 13, 25, uh, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And then there's a tremendous earthquake. Uh, the Philippian jailer comes down, uh, supposing that everybody has probably escaped, which means he would be executed. And Paul says, hey, don't worry, bro. I think it's in there somewhere. He says, <laughs> he says we're all here. We're all here. Nothing to worry about. And he says, man, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's probably saying, what must I do to be saved in terms of not losing my life and my job and my livelihood and my home and everything else associated with being uh, the warden of the prison? But, of course, Paul takes that opportunity to explain there's, there's something more important than just your job and your livelihood. You can truly be saved through Jesus Christ. Of course, he got so excited you know the story. He takes Paul upstairs where he's able to preach the gospel to his entire family. Uh, they all receive the Lord and are, and are baptized. That's a great response. Felix is, uh, is not the response uh, that we want to follow in regard to salvation, certainly. But as we walk with the Lord and he speaks to our hearts in regards to other things. One last little poem on this idea of procrastination. Uh, uh, about a young man that says he was going to be all that a mortal should be tomorrow no one would be better than he tomorrow each morning he stacked up letters he would write tomorrow it was too bad indeed he was too busy to see his friend but he promised he would do it tomorrow the greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow the world would have known him had he ever seen tomorrow but the fact is he died and fainted from view, and all that was left when living was through was a mountain of things he intended to do tomorrow. Uh, now, again, you know, we all, you know, just a little confession here. I, I, uh, I had a stack of thank you notes I've put off for two weeks. I want you to know I, I wrote them all, sent them all out yesterday. <laughs> little application there. But uh, it's really talking about spiritual things, not uh, whether you need to mow your lawn when you go home today or not, because you haven't done it in a month. It's talking about hearing from God, uh, hearing from his voice. When you hear that voice, and he's leading you, and he's guiding you, and he's directing you, uh, and you sense it, and you feel it, act, act upon it. Because it's a dangerous thing not to. But when you do, you gain even more from it in terms of deepening your relationship with Christ. Uh, and uh, there's... There's just not a shortcut to that. Uh, you know, it's that uh, uh, obedience to him in these little things uh, that end up leading to awesome direction from the Lord and his blessing uh, from our lives. As Tom likes to say, it's always the right time to do the right thing. And uh, that, that, that's, that's part of this whole, whole message here uh, that I think all of us need to hear. Well, let's, let's pray. Lord, we do come to you and uh, we pray uh, first and foremost, Lord, if there's anyone here and they haven't ever received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, maybe, maybe they're, they're like Felix and Drusilla. Uh, they were both pretty familiar with Christianity and you know, knew, probably knew the facts about Jesus, the message that he came and uh, lived a perfect sinless life and then died on a Roman cross and he rose again but it never really acted upon that message. Paul gives them an opportunity. Hey, one day we're all going to stand in terms of a judgment before others, and uh, the Lord will be there. He'll either be our Savior or our judge. If you're unsure about who Jesus is to you, your Savior or your judge, I just want to give you an opportunity so I can pray with you and pray for you. If you just want to uh, lift your hand just for a moment, just so I, I can acknowledge with you, uh, your commitment to him, you want to give your life to him, you would like to have uh, forgiveness of sins uh, in a place in heaven uh, for all eternity. Uh, it's just hard to preach a message like this and, and not give an opportunity for, uh, for a response, just so that you can know that you know 
Uh, there's nothing that says you'll have another opportunity if God is speaking to your heart. If you think, well, I kind of know this, but I don't think I've ever really acted on it. Or I'm afraid that uh, I may never have another opportunity. Well, that's actually true. You, you might not. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for you to simply raise your hand, pray to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and sa Savior, to know what it is to have your, your sins forgiven and a clear conscience, have a relationship with the God that created you, the God that made you, the God that, uh, uh, that loved you so much that he sent his, his only begotten son to die on a Roman cross for your sins. There's nothing greater, there's nothing more important. As Daniel Webster said, there's nothing more important to think than the thought about our personal accountability to God. So let's, let's pray. Lord, we
He makes me strong. I will love you, Lord. I 